Okay, all sorts of things open on my computer. <coughs> Many of them related to trying to figure out how to make audio work. Okay, this is um, chapter four lecture. So let's get this started. Let's review briefly the stuff we learned in the earlier chapters about samples and populations. A sample is a subset of the observations available from a larger group. And when we have a sample, when we don't have the... Um, the whole entire population, but we don't have all possible observations, we just have some of them, then the numbers that we calculate from that, like the mean and the standard deviation and the median and stuff, we call those statistics, just to confuse things, because statistics means like five things. And this is one of the things that means. It means values from a sample as opposed to a population. So the mean, the standard deviation, median. The population is the place that the sample came from. The population is all possible observations. Now sometimes we will assume that populations are infinite in size, which is silly because there's no such thing as infinite anything, really. It's a theoretical doohickey that we use because apparently it makes the math nice. Um, so sometimes I'll say, you know, infinite population or something like that. But really all a population means is all of the possible observations. Frequently they're very large numbers, numbers that might as well for mathematical purposes and for the kind of estimates we want to make, they might as well be infinite. So something like the American population or even the Texas population, once you get up into many, many thousands and above, then you don't get much more precise estimates by going from thousands to millions, for instance. So we might as well be infinite as far as our purposes go. The numbers we calculate from a population, so like the mean and the standard deviation, etc., we call them parameters. And we often represent them with Greek letters, like the mean is mu, which is the Greek m, and the standard deviation is sigma, which is the Greek s. So inferential statistics, as opposed to descriptive statistics, inferential statistics are the things that link our samples to our populations. So descriptive statistics, you just take a group of numbers that you have access to, usually a sample, and you say, well, what's the average in this? Like you can say, what's the mean or what's the median? What's the standard deviation of these numbers? But inferential statistics is when you don't have access to a population, but you do have access to a sample, and you use the values in the sample to make guesses about what's in the population. They're not crazy guesses, at least we hope. Some guesses are much better than others. Um, these guesses, we call them estimates. So one important thing to remember, and it runs through all of statistics, is that there is variation in samples. Now this might seem so obvious, as to be ridiculous, but you need to think about it for a minute. One sample is not the same as other samples. A sample is not a population, and the difference between the values you can calculate from a sample and the values you can calculate from the population, we call that sampling error. And the sampling error will be different in one sample compared to another sample. We do a lot of stuff to try and prevent ourselves from jumping to crazy conclusions based on something that was probably just sampling error. It that we just happened to get a bunch of smart people in our sample and then we conclude that, I don't know, UT Brownsville students are the smartest in the world, when in fact we just accidentally got a bunch of smart people. Random sampling means random anything can happen. It means extreme things are unlikely to happen, but that's not impossible. So we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how likely would this be if we were randomly sampling, etc. So we randomly sample because random sampling guarantees that if we were to keep doing this, keep randomly sampling over and over and over and over again, that the average of all those samples, the average of, say, the means we got from all those samples, or the average of the standard deviations we got from those samples, or the medians we got from all those samples, um, if it was millions and millions of samples from the same population, randomly sampled, the average estimates that we got would be the population values. So the average of all the means that we got from all the possible samples would be the population mean. So the mean of the means would be the population mean. And that's what random sampling does for us. It doesn't guarantee that one particular sample will look like the population, but it does guarantee that if we keep doing this over and over and over again, eventually um, the average of all those things will look like the population. That's an important concept. So we spend a lot of time trying to do um, trying to estimate what's going on in the population. 
Well, that requires two things. Just as with descriptive statistics, we were interested not only in the mean, but in the standard deviation, or the median, but also in the median absolute deviation, or the interquartile range. We need both an estimate of exactly where something is, an estimate of location, like center, like a mean, and we need to know what the variation of that is supposed to be. So just knowing the average of a group doesn't tell you much about the group unless you also know the standard deviation or the IQR or something like that. Because as you know, an average with a small standard deviation is a pretty good estimate, a pretty good representation of everybody in the group. But an average with a large standard deviation or large variability of any kind, no matter how you measure it, that average is not a very good representation of what's going on in that group. The same thing when we're trying to estimate the population. So when we're estimating things from the population, we often do start with what's called point estimation. And that's a fancy term for just saying we take a value from the sample and we assume that it applies to the population. So we take a sample from the population. We calculate a statistic, say the mean, and that's it. That's your estimate. So sample values are automatically estimates of population values. So the big, big problem we have with this is that we never know how good our estimates are. How good is our estimate, our sample estimate, of the population values? And we really need to know variability for that. We need to know how variable are the estimates, not just how variable are the values in the population, but how variable are our estimates like how much variability should there be in those estimates? And that's where confidence intervals come in. So we're going to start talking about confidence intervals, and chapter 4 is largely about confidence intervals. We have to talk about some other things to get this hammered down, but confidence intervals are mainly where we're going. <coughs> Anybody get the uh, fifth element reference there? Anyway, So to talk about the sampling or confidence intervals, we need to understand a basic but kind of complicated and kind of difficult concept. It's not as complicated as you might think, and once you've got it locked in, you'll think, oh, this wasn't so hard. But this is maybe the biggest individual leap you have to make mentally in this class. So I'll be going over this and over this and referring to it and telling you about it and if, assuming you understand it, etc. Go over this as many times as you need to until it makes sense. And then when you go to sleep, it won't make sense anymore in the morning. So go back and do it again, and do it again, and do it again. Keep reading, keep watching, keep, above all, keep thinking, trying to imagine these thought experiments until this makes sense. If you're lucky, it will make sense immediately. Um, if you're not lucky, it will take a while to make sense. Now let's see. I'm worried that the volume is getting out of control here. Oh, that's my how to adjust Microsoft volume. Don't look at any of the tabs on my browser. That's that that way lies madness. All right, well, I can't figure out how to adjust it. So, moving on. Um what you should know about the sampling distribution. First of all, you should know what the sampling distribution of means is, sometimes called the sampling distribution of the mean, same thing. You should know what its properties are. You should know how it's different from a regular distribution. You should know specifically how to describe what that sampling distribution is. You should know how to tell what its mean and its standard deviation are. So you should be able to tell, uh, take a regular distribution, and I will tell you it's normal and it has, or mostly normal, and it has a mean of this and a standard deviation of this. From that, oh, and from that you should tell me what the sampling distribution of means from that s distribution would be if the sample size was such and such. And you'll see what that means in a minute. Every different sample size gives you a different sampling distribution of means. So the sampling distribution of means is a thought experiment. I suppose you could do, you could kind of do it in real life, but it would take a lot of work. So it's a population. And you start with a regular population. So you imagine the population, since we almost never actually have access to a true population. You have to imagine the population in other words, all possible observations of some kind. And then you have to imagine taking a sample of a particular size. So let's say the population is, um, I don't know, IQ of all Americans. So you've got almost 400 million IQs there. Imagine you had access to all of them. And, take, and imagine you took a sample of 100 people, randomly selected. Somehow you put 400 million names in a hat and you randomly selected 100. So you took 100 people, as a sample, and you calculated the mean of those 100 people. 
and then you threw them back in the bowl, their names back in the bowl, and then you do that again. Select another 100 people, calculate their mean, throw it back, select another 100 people. Each time you select randomly, then you do it millions and millions of times. In fact, doing it an infinite number of times. So even though we can never do this an infinite number of times in reality, um, we know what the result would be if we did, because of the beauty of mathematics and mathematicians doing things that are more complicated than I know how to do. But the point is, you write down all the sample means. The sampling distribution of means is the collection of all of those means. So it's a distribution of all possible means. Now pay attention, it, it, and remember that a sampling distribution of means depends on a particular sample size. If you change the sample size, then you change the sampling distribution of means. So a sampling distribution of means is the distribution, the collection of all possible means taken from a sample through a random sampling procedure where each sample had a very particular sample size. So when we say the sampling distribution of means, we'll say from this population, um, and we'll say with a sample size of 10, or with a sample size of 1,000, or a sample size of 45, or something like that, because that determines an important part of what the sampling distribution is. So we can imagine a sampling distribution for any sample as long as we make some assumptions as we go. So here's the layout. We imagine some imaginary population that gave rise to a mean. And this is kind of the logic we're going to use for confidence intervals. We're going to have a sample here. And, it's, and that sample is going to give us a mean. X bar is the mean. And we'll imagine that that mean came from an imaginary population. And for convenience, because we have nothing else to do, remember every sample value is an estimate of a population parameter. So this is our point estimate of the mean in the population. So even though we know it's unlikely to be true, we say, well, for now, we're, let's just assume that the mean in the population is actually exactly the same as our sample mean, even though we know that's a little silly. But why not? It's, our, it's the only estimate we have. So we assume that our sample came from that population. And we know what our sample size was. Let's say our sample size was 100. So our sample came from that population, um, and our sample has 100 uh, observations in it, so maybe 100 people's IQ. And so then we say, how can we make sense of this sample? How can we understand where this sample fits with all the other possible samples that we might have gotten if we'd done things a little differently? And this is where confidence intervals come in. This is where sampling distributions uh, pay off. So we imagine drawing lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of samples, millions and millions and millions of samples. Each sample came from 100 observations. Well, in this example, I say 100. You, you pick the same number that your particular sample has as a sample size. So let's say if our sample has 100 observations, then let we imagine all possible samples of 100 observations taken from this imaginary population. This population of all IQs, of all Americans, where we assume for a minute that the mean of that of that population is actually our sample mean, that those are the same. And then we plot all of those means that we got, all of those millions and millions of means. Each mean came from an individual sample, a random sample of 100 people. And uh, we calculated the mean from that. And we plot all those means in a big distribution. And what we'll get is a very normal looking distribution that has a mean. And the mean will be the same as the sample mean. We guaranteed it. That's an important thing to remember. The mean of the distribution of means is the same as the mean of the population that that distribution came from. And if we've decided that that population has a mean that is the same as our sample mean, then those are all the same thing. Our sample mean is the same as our imaginary population mean. That's the same as the mean of the sampling distribution of means. But this is where we were going, the sampling distribution of means. So once we do that, we have a sample estimate, a sample mean, and then we have a distribution of all possible sample means that we could possibly observe if we were to randomly sample from a population that had this as its mean. So this gives us an idea of how spread out that's, that's all this is really about. This gives us an idea of how spread out all possible sample means should be. So if it's really, really spread out, then we look at our mean and we say, well, we can't have much confidence in this mean. It could be anywhere. But if it's not very spread out, if it's really tightly constricted into a, a small area, all possible means are. And 
and very few means are way out on the edges and most of the means are packed in the middle, then we say, oh, we have much more confidence that this is a good estimate of that population mean. So this is all a long process for us to decide how confident are we in this. Are we really confident that you know, most of the means we could possibly get are in a small area, therefore this is probably pretty close to the sample or the population mean? Or are we not very confident because all possible means are just spread all over the place? That's the sampling distribution of means. It's all possible means that are like our mean. Oh, I forgot I made that wiggle. Okay, so the big question we have here is, did our sample come from this population? What sample did it come, what population did it come from? Well, we don't know, but we can tell how precise our estimation is. So the sampling distribution of means, if you want to do a little um, activity, you can follow these instructions. You need to install the audio package. I've been having problems installing packages lately, so maybe you will too, who knows. And then you do this command right here, source. Source means go to this place and yank this thing into R and make it part of R. So I have this function called CLT demo, um, uh, central limit theorem demo. And so if you do source and yank this in here, then you'll have a new function. And the new function is graph CLT. And you need to give it three numbers. N, the number of observations per sample. S, the number of samples. And then T, that's where this audio package comes in. It just tells it how long to wait each, you know, how many seconds or whatever to wait between each, um, each time it does this. Anyway, um, I'm going to do this here. And... Let's just run this thing and see what happens. And I've already, I've already done this source thing, but I'll show you how it works. It's not too complicated as long as you're connected to the internet. I'll just copy that. I made sure I used non-curly quotation marks there. Now I've got this function. So I'm going to do this thing: graph CLT uh, three one hundred one. So what this is showing me is just a kind of a silly representation. We imagine some distribution that can go from 0 to 100, some, some scale that can go from 0 to 100. And we imagine that there's an equal number of zeros and ones and twos and you know, all the way up to 100, that everything's equally distributed there. So a uniform distribution. But we imagine ourselves sampling from it. And each sample has three observations. So the gray lines you see popping up in threes, that's a sample of three observations. And then the, the pink or red line you see popping up is the mean of that sample. So every time you see three gray lines, that's one sample being taken from that big population, a population that's equally represented zeros up to hundreds. And then each pink line <coughs> is the mean. So the only thing that gets plotted there is the pink lines, the mean. So the mean of each sample gets put as a box, uh, kind of a weird looking box. Anyway, those boxes get stacked like a histogram. So you can see the way this works here. This is showing us taking three sam or samples of three observations over and over and over again, and then plotting the mean of those samples. You can see that things are clustering more in the middle, and there's less on the edges. And this makes sense. If you pick one observation, it's, it's equally likely to be a 0 or a 100, right? But if you pick three observations, and then you only plot the mean, well, maybe one of the observations will be really low or really high, but there's probably other observations that you randomly sampled that won't be really low or high. I mean, the odds of all the observations being really high or really low are, are small. And so the means are going to cluster a little more in the middle than the actual observations themselves are. So let me stop this here, and let me uh, rerun this 5, 300, and 0.3. So um, graph CLT 5, 300. Point three. So it's going to go faster. It's going to do means from samples uh, of five observations in each sample. It's going to do 300 of those. And it's going to do it a lot faster. Oops. There we go. I need to switch over. So it's doing it faster. Five observations at a time. And the mean of each sample. Each sample has five observations in it. So you notice there's, there's very few observations out here on the edges. Extreme observations are not common. They're less common when we have ten or five observations because what are the odds that all five observations would be high? In fact, that's what this is all about. This is all about the probability. 
So you can see things are starting to pile up in the middle here. So I'm going to nix this here. Now I'm going to run a slightly different version of this. This I yanked from my website too. You can get it if you want. It's called um, CLT demo no lines underscore no lines. You can look at my website and grab that one if you want to do this. So I'm going to do that one. <coughs> I did a really crappy job of programming animation and the lines were screwing things up so I made a different version. Uh, so samples that are larger now, size 10, 700 of them and very brief delay in between everything. What? All right. Um, maybe I forgot to get that. Oh. Okay. There we go. So no lines. Every dot you see is a mean from a sample that had 10 observations. 10 observations randomly sampled from this uniform population that goes from 0 to 100. It's like a deck of cards with 100 cards in it. There's a 0, there's a 1, there's a 2. So anytime you grab one card, it's equally likely to be a 0 or a 1 or a 55 or an 80 or a 100. However, you see that the mean of 10 observations is not very likely to be a big number or a small number. As a matter of fact, it's likely to be a middle number. And the larger the sample size, and these crawling little things are due to the, the way I told it to do the histogram and bin the observations, the more, um, the, the larger the sample size for this demonstration, the more the observations will be clustered in the middle because the less likely it is that you will get all those observations clustering up on one end. So if you if you have a sample size of 100, I mean, you're never going to get all 100 of those on one end. I mean, it's possible, but it's really unlikely. So it's much more likely that you would get a whole bunch of, like every time there's an extreme one, you have plenty of other observations that cancel that out and bring the mean back close to the middle. So you see that this is starting to make a middle-ish lump. Because this is real randomness, it's not going to become smooth and perfect, but you can see that the shape is becoming roughly normal. Even here, it's starting to look a little bell. It's starting to get a little tail, and then go up and have little shoulders. And then the shoulder goes and trims down again, and then curves off into the little skirt of the bell. So this is one of the demonstrations that shows you that this really is a random process, and that the random process creates the bell curve. So we did this. That was fun. Um, and this is a sampling distribution of means. It's a group of a whole bunch of means sampled from something, but unlike my little demonstration, it's an infinite number of means. It's all possible means from all so possible samples of a particular size from a population. So I'm going to flip back and forth over and over again between the distribution of raw scores and the distribution of means, which is the sampling distribution. In the distribution of raw scores, sometimes I call that the distribution of x. x is a raw score. So raw score is the original observations. I might call it the original distribution. I might refer to sigma x or, or mu x. My goodness, that's a u. How did I do that? It's supposed to be a mu. Sorry about that. I might refer to the standard deviation of x or the, or the mean of x, etc. The sampling distribution of the means, maybe it is a mu and this is just a stupid font. I'll just choose to believe that I didn't screw that up so badly. The sampling distribution of means, I might call it the, the distribution of the mean or the SDM sampling distribution of means, um, distribution of means, and I might call it mu sub x bar. Now, I didn't write an x bar because that's practically impossible. It's really annoying. You have to use graphics in Windows. There's no x bar character that I can find anywhere. I might call it sub SDM or something like that. Um, so I might use that for the standard deviation, etc. Now the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean has a special a special name. It's called the standard error of the mean, sometimes abbreviated SEM, and we're going to deal with that an awful lot. So the sampling distribution of the mean has a particular shape. That shape is generally normal. It's more. It's almost always more normal than the original distribution. The only way it's not more normal than the original distribution is if the original distribution of raw scores was perfectly normal to begin with. 
So it always becomes either more normal or it just reaches perfect normality and you can't get more normal than that. And that's a beautiful thing. We love the fact that it gets more and more normal. So it's approximately normal in almost all cases. However, the sampling distribution is more and more normal as the sample size of each of those samples from which a mean was taken gets bigger. So if it's a sampling distribution based on means from samples of, of size 4, millions and millions of four observation samples, it'll be somewhat normal, more normal than the original. But if it's based on samples of size 100 or 200 or something, it'll be very, very normal. As n approaches infinity, it becomes more and more normal. So you could take the craziest shape imaginable, and if you had an infinite sample size, which is kind of crazy to imagine, you took a whole, an infinite number of infinite sample sizes, then it would be perfectly normal. The sampling distribution of the means that resulted would be perfectly normal. But basically, it's normal enough almost all the time if n is greater than 30 and if there's not very much skew in the original distribution. So that's a nice little rule of thumb for us to follow because we're very concerned with whether the sampling distribution of the means is normal enough for our purposes. And, those, and that's a good rule. So the mean of the sampling distribution of means, so I put that here, I, I wrote it mu sub SDM. I could have wrote, written mu sub X with a bar over it. Is the same as the mean of the original distribution. So the mean of the means is the mean, as one of my students once said a long time ago, and it kind of sticks in your head. The mean of the sampling distribution of means is the same as the mean of the original population. The standard deviation of that mean is called the standard error of the mean, or sometimes we say SE sub N, or just SE for standard error, or sigma sub SDM, or sigma sub X bar. And the way we calculate that is very easy. You take the standard deviation of the original population distribution, and you divide that by the square root of n. Sometimes you put this over the square root of n. So it's not just divided by n, it's by the square root of n. So as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this gets small or sorry, this gets smaller and smaller and smaller because n is in the denominator. This is being divided by the square root of n. So what does the sampling distribution of the mean tell us? It tells us the distribution of all possible sample means um, that we could find with random sampling with a specific sample size for each sample. And from a population that has, that has a mean and a standard deviation that we know, those are things that we need to know if we want to specify what the sampling distribution of means really is. And we need to specify that because we're going to use that sampling distribution of means, its values, to find our confidence intervals. So it tells us the probabilities of finding certain sample means if we were to randomly sample. It's a theoretical distribution. We're never going to observe it. Um, but we still can specify its properties very specifically based on these assumptions that we make. So let's take this example. Here's a raw distribution, a raw score distribution, GRE scores in the old school method. They had a mean of 500, a standard deviation of 100. So let's imagine that we take a sample of, of 16 people's scores randomly. And we want to imagine how those samples, how that sample fits in with other samples of 16 scores. Well, we can imagine the sampling distribution of means for that. For all possible samples of size n equals 16, 16 observations per sample coming from here, millions and millions and millions and millions of, of samples taken from there, the mean of each sample calculated, and then we plot all those means. It'll be on the same scale, because a mean is on the same scale as raw score observations, and it will be a much skinnier distribution. Um, so an n of 16, the original standard deviation, the mean's going to be the same, that's why I lined these up vertically, the mean will still be 500, the mean of the sampling distribution of means. The standard deviation of this distribution, which I note here as sigma sub x bar, is going to be the original standard deviation, 100 here, divided by the square root of n, the square root of the sample size of each of those samples that went into creating those means that created this distribution. So that will be 100, which is our original standard deviation, divided by the square root of 16, which is 100 divided by 4, which is 25. So that's the standard deviation. The original standard deviation was 100, and now we have a much skinnier distribution, standard deviation of 25. Now we could turn this into z-scores, and the z-scores will not line up because now we have a different standard deviation. So you notice these z-scores here are very spread out, and these ones are squished together. Remember that 68% of the distribution is contained between the z-score of plus and minus 1, in other words, between one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below.
So here, that's between uh, 400 and 600. Here, plus and minus 1, it's still around 500, but it's only 25 up. So it's between 475 and 525. So 68% of these scores are in a much smaller space now. So here's, to, here's just some more examples and exercises. I'll pause here so you can figure these out if you want to. So let's say there's a summer camp for children, and the ages of those children are approximately normally distributed with a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 3. Notice those are Greek letters, so that's the population. That's all the summer camp kids. So let's say it's, I don't know, a thousand kids who go through that camp every year or something. So we imagine an infinite number of samples where n equals 16. So find the, the mean of the distribution of means, of the sampling distribution of means, and the standard error, meaning the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of means. So, the mean of the original distribution is, this, is what is going to be the mean of the sampling distribution. It's 12. The standard error, in other words, the standard deviation, or sorry, the standard, yeah, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of means is the original standard deviation, which is 3, divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 16. So 3 divided by the square root of 16 is 3 divided by 4, that's 0.75. So, let's go back to this example again, but let's specify just a different sample size. Everything's the same, but a bigger sample size. First of all, think to yourself, is the sampling distribution of means for this going to be bigger, you know, larger standard deviation, fatter, wider, or smaller, like skinnier, tinier? than the previous sampling distribution of means. If the sample size is n equals 144, does that make a, a fatter or a skinnier uh, sampling distribution of means? So imagine that to yourself before you move on. So here's the solution to that. The mean is the same as the original mean. Again, it's 12. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution of means is the original standard deviation, but this time divided by the square root of a bigger number, of 144. And I kind of went the easy route and chose an, a perfect square. 144 is 12 squared, so 3 divided by the square root of 144 is 3 divided by 12, which is 0.25. So here's a graph of this. So you've got the original distribution down here. It's really stretched out so I can show the detail in the other distributions. That's the distribution of all the kids' ages. This blue line here is the standard is the sampling distribution of means for all the means for the sample size of 16. And you'll see that's skinnier and taller, so more of the scores are kind of concentrated in a smaller area in the middle, and that has a standard deviation of 0.75. And then the sampling distribution of means for n of 144 is much skinnier. All the scores are piled up here in the middle. The density is really great right there in the middle. So a lot of the scores are really crowded around that number 12, which is the mean. So like from 13 to 15 would be, I'm oh sorry, from 11 to 13 would be a lot of the scores would be contained there. Okay, uh, another exercise here. A cable company produces cables of exact length. Um, I should say diameter. All the cables produced uh, for an entire month are measured, and the average diameter is a mean of 1237 millimeters. That's a big fat cable. Um, with a standard deviation of 124. What do I know? I don't know th anything about cables, but this is a very common quality control problem. So for the sampling distribution of n equals 9, let's say you take a sample of 9 of those cables and you keep sampling 9 over and over and over again. Find the mean of the sampling distribution of means and the standard error, in other words, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of means. So the mean is the same as the original distribution mean, 1,237 millimeters. And the standard error is the original standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So 124 divided by the square root of 9 which works out to be 41.33 millimeters. Now let's take this again and just change the sample size. Let's make it bigger. Now the sample size isn't 9, it's 100. Think to yourself, is that going to make you make a, a wider, a more varied sampling distribution of the mean, or one that has less variance, that has a smaller standard deviation, standard error? 
So the mean will be the same as the original mean, 1,237 millimeters. The standard error will be the original standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. What? Okay, obviously there's an error there. Let me just fix that. As you know, I often do. The square root of 100 is not 20. It looks like I got the rest of this right, though. So 124 divided by 10 is 12.4. So to show that visually, the original distribution is here. And here's our scale. 1,237 is right here in the middle. Our first sampling distribution of the means for n equals 9 is here. And that ended up giving us a standard deviation from here, this standard deviation, the wide one, the original raw scores, that standard deviation was 124 millimeters. This one is smaller. It's only 41 something, 41.3 or something millimeters. And then this one is much smaller. When the sampling distribution is 10, it's only 12.4. So it goes from over 100 down to like 40, or down to about 40, and then down to like 12. So we see a big difference. The sampling distribution of the mean getting skinny is very good for us when we want to do confidence intervals. So a city in New York takes a census of its population. The mean age is 43.1 years, 2.7 years standard deviation. If we took all possible samples of size uh, 4, then find the mean and the standard deviation of that sampling distribution of means that we would have of the means of all possible samples of size n equals 4. The mean would be the same as the original raw score mean. So that's the mean of that population is 43.1. The standard deviation would be the original raw score standard deviation, 2.7, divided by the square root of the sample size, the square root of 4. So it's divided by 2. So that's going to be 1.35 years standard deviation. So let's do that again with a different sample size, this time a sample size of 25. And at this point, you should know whether that makes the sampling distribution of the means have a bigger standard deviation or a smaller standard deviation, the fact that we increase the sample size. So the, the mean will be the same as the original mean, 43.1 years. The standard error of the mean, in other words, the sampling distribution of the means standard deviation, is 2.7, the original standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 25. So that gives us about a half a year, 0 0.54 years. So here's uh, a graphic representation of that. The original uh, sam sampling distribution, a standard deviation is 2.7. This one here had like one and a third years. And then this one here has about a half a year as a standard deviation. So increasing that sample size really gave us a lot lower variability in the sampling distribution of means. I don't know why I'm even numbering these things. but So let's go back to the summer camp children's ages. Same problem. But now let's imagine sample size n equals 16. I'm giving perfect squares to make the math nice and easy. So imagine we randomly selected samples and calculated means for each of them. What percentage of those means, this is an important kind of question, we got all the possible means from all possible samples of size 16 kids. No, 16 kids at once. What percentage of the sample means would be greater than 13 years old? In what percentage of those samples would the average kid be greater than or older than 13 years old? And compare that to what percentage of the individual campers, not means, but the individual campers would be greater than 13 years old. We can use z-scores to answer both of these. So let's look at this. The sampling distribution of the mean, n equals 16. Um, if the standard deviation here is 3, then with a sample size of 16, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of means would be the original standard deviation of 3 divided by the square root of 16. So 3 divided by 4, so 0 0.75. So you can figure out the z-score. You can say um, for 13, what's the z-score? 13 minus 12 divided by 0 0.75. You can look up that z-score in your table, or you can use R nor or P norm or something like that.
and you can figure out what this area here is under this curve, the sampling distribution of the means. And you can compare it to that same area, starting from the same area, but uh, the same point, age 13, and the area under the original distributions. It turns out the area under the original distribution, if you calculate the z-score for that, and it's a different z-score because this has a different standard deviation, about over, over a third, about 37% of kids will be older than 13 if it's truly a normally distribute var distributed variable. However, only about 10% of samples with 16 kids in them will have an average that is greater than, than age 13. So back to the cable company. Let's say, um, what percentage of, ca of just cables coming out of the company? would have out of the factory would have a di diameter less than 1200 millimeters and now if we had again sample size of 16 what percentage of means from these samples would would be an average mean of the samples less than 1200 millimeters again two seven separate questions now let's throw in a third one a larger sample size let's say means from sample size of 49 49 cent 49 observations per sample you can figure that out if you feel like it. It shouldn't be too uh, too tough. It's three z-score problems. Just remember what the denominator is in all of them. So, in the original sample, or the original population, we have this. It's actually going to be about 38% of cables will have a diameter less than 1,200 millimeters. Uh, you can figure that out by taking 1,200 minus 1,237, uh, that'll give you a negative number divided by 124. That'll give you your z-score. And then look up at the area below that z-score. And that'll give you this. Or you can use p-norm, which is what I did. Now, sample means of n equals 16. Sample means of n equals 49. So 124 divided by the square root of 16, that'll give you a much smaller standard deviation. The standard deviation of this blue curve here. In other words, the standard error of the sampling distribution of means of n equals 16. And then you look up the z-score for 1,200 in that distribution, and you'll find that the area is smaller. It's about 12% down from 38%. Only about 12% of the means, if each mean came from a sample of n equals 16, will have, um, will have a diameter less than 1,200. And then if you have a sample, samples of 49, only about 2%, 1.8%, this, this little teeny green corner here from 1,200 in this green distribution, only about 1.8% of this green distribution has diameter less than 1,200. So I have lots of examples here. So the census, let's look now, I think this is our last example, what ages in this distribution would include the middle 68% of individual ages. Find the middle 68%. You can use the 68, 95, 99, 7 rule. So one standard deviation below 43.1 years and one standard deviation above. But then let's look at all possible samples of n equals 25. So in the sampling distribution of means for that, what percentage of ages would include the middle percentage of sample means of ages from sample size 25? So the original distribution, you have a sample, uh, a sample standard deviation, or sorry, a population standard deviation of 2.7. So one 2.7 down from here is 40.4, and one 2.7 up from here is 45.8. So these are the two numbers that cut off the middle 68% of all the ages. Two-thirds, a little over two-thirds of New Yorkers or whatever will have um, an age between 40.4 years old and 45.8 years old. Now let's look at the sampling distribution of means. It has a much smaller standard deviation. It has the original standard deviation but divided by this square root of the sample size. What was the sample size here? Sample size was 25. So 2.7 divided by the square root of 25, which is 5. So 2.7 divided by 5, which gives us 0.54. So one half a year now. So now starting from 43.1, from 42.6 up to 43.6. So if you're taking samples of 25, you would expect two-thirds of those 
of the means of those samples, the means of two-thirds of those samples, to be between about 42 and a half and 43 and a half years old. <coughs> That's a much smaller area there. And this is confidence intervals. This is what we're doing here. And I think we're just about done here. So this is a comparison of those two things. This is a comparison of the middle 68% of the raw scores and the middle 68% of the sampling distribution of means for a sample size of n equals 25 both put side by side, or sorry, just overlapped right on top of each other. You can see the massive difference in the variability here. 68% of the scores here are included between these things, but because this distribution, distribution is so much skinnier, 68% of the scores here are included between the much tighter areas just within about one year range. And that's all. So I'll post the rest of these a little bit later.